more of the children's church dismissed. Take our Bibles this morning. Let's go over to Philippians chapter 3 verses 10 through 20. Philippians chapter 3 10 through 20. The message this morning is entitled The Longest Ride. It is regarding our commitment to Christianity to biblical faith, biblical trust, afflictions, there's a difference between trust and trust in God. There's a difference in faith and faith in God. There's a difference from facing affliction without God and facing affliction with God. There is the world doesn't understand the difference. Just because we're a Christian, I would love to say we never face any more adversity. Everything goes smooth. Nothing ever happens. We don't ever get sick. We don't ever get in financial problems. We don't have our faith. Mm, please sign me up for that life. <laughs> it's not the case. Life is full of issues. And you know what? A lot of us here, we'd be called the Generation X. We are, we are the generation that can say, to be honest, we know what it was to have a corded phone. We know what it was to have calculators instead of um, phones. You know, we were pre-internet and we've survived. You know, we were able to ride bikes without helmets and all of us are here. We're little brains full, you know. You know, we, we, we jumped off things. We, you know, for real cool bikes, we put hockey cards on uh, clothes pins on our bikes. And we did things that we rode in the back of the car truck. It was, probably wasn't the safest thing to do it, but it sure was fun. You know, we went to town that way. We have done a lot of things. And you look at this. We have a lot of experience we can pass on. We have a lot of we know what adversity is. And our parents taught us don't let adversity define us. A lot of people quit. 
don't let adversity knock us out. My dad says one word wasn't in our vocabulary was can't. I can't do that. He basically says, you're saying I won't do that. Try it. If you fail, guess what we've learned? We do it again. How many times did we do school projects? I remember my first one, third grade, paper mache volcano. Have, who's ever tried that one? Paper mache does not do what it's supposed to do. I don't care what they tell you. Half the time, either that or I soaked it too long or whatever like that. But you try. It was your show and tell. I don't know if they had that fun anymore. I, I love that at school. Bring it in something. Do something. You know, craft projects. I, I remember sitting in sixth grade, shop class. I like shop class. It was pretty fun. My sister took home ec. She learned to sew. She learned to do knitting and some other things. This is what PE, man, it was a lot of fun. Dodgeball, man. <laughs> that, was, that was great. If you, if you knocked a few teeth out, you're doing good. It was part of our training, and that defined all of us. Were we all picked on? I know I was. I was four eyes. You know, I was buck tooth. You know, I, I was, you know, I had salmon color pants with a bright silver space jacket. Man, I was cool. <laughs> you know, we had a lot of adversities, but how did it define us? Did we grow past it? Did we shut ourselves off? Did we learn to cope with it? I believe a lot of us did. We became our parents. You think about it. Many of them come back from the war. World War II engulfed the world. They came back from the war. They put on civvies and life went on. They never even blinked. You think about how our world has changed. Now adversity, if someone says boo, we have to go have hot chocolate and color and kind of safe space. Let's be honest. How many times did somebody yell boo at us? And we we're like, really? We go on. The longest ride is our life. It is our journey of life. Unfortunately, we can't get off. Many people try to end their lives and say, I, I want it done. You know what? A life is a journey. It really is. I was saying in Sunday school, I have some friends that we sold a horse to years ago. Every year they begin, she's a photographer and so is he, but they're also cowboys out in Kansas. And every year they go on a cattle drive from Kansas to Texas. They can't just get off and say, I quit. <laughs> they're in the saddle for weeks in rain, in sandstorms, snowstorms, whatever. I mean, they, they've had, I've seen some beautiful pictures of freak things. Snow, S dust just covered. They take their bandana off and there's just their faces just black with dust. I'm thinking, and guess what? They don't get a shower. <laughs> they, they, they wash themselves off at a nearest creek or wherever like it, but they endure it. And they always make a comment, the first few miles are rough, then I got numb. <laughs> you know, and that's the case. And as I mentioned in the youth, times that we've been on riding, our longest ride was about 10 miles, close to 10 miles a day. The next day hurts really bad. Then after that, it gets better. You get off and you wonder, where'd that muscle come from? I never experienced that muscle. And then your, your rear is numb. You're always adjusting, trying to get that blood flowing back in it. Then the rain comes. You got to be prepared for everything. Your commitment to Christianity as a child of God is a lifetime commitment. Our commitment to life is basically a death do us part. Quitting it early, that really doesn't help because then is eternity. If we don't have eternity assured then what do we have? And as you look at Paul, Paul is writing in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 10. He's talking about an acceptable sacrifice. And he says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. 
Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthened me. Notwithstanding, you have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as, as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica you sent once again into my necessity, not because I desired a gift, but I, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, have received of Epaphroditus the things which were set from you, an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Jesus, by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the last words he wrote to the Philippians. But I want to show you another verse where Paul's mind is. In chapter 4, he is talking about he has been through adversity. His life, of all the churches he planted, one supported him financially. Even in the midst of affliction, he says, your care of me is awesome. He says, I've learned to be full. I've learned to be hungry. But in whatever state I am, I've learned to be content. I can do all things through Christ who strengthen me. How did he get to this mindset? That's a good question. Let's turn back to chapter 3 and verse 13 and 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Everything we go through, the reason he can write a very famous passage, I can do all things through Christ who strengthen me. That I've learned to be content is because back in chapter 3 he gives the key to enduring the longest ride of life. I do forgetting those sayings which are behind. He's not dwelling on the adversities of life. He's dwelling on the promise of heaven. I press toward the mark. What's his mark? Finishing the race. That's what he says in 2 Timothy. If you, as a Christian, dwell on the adversities, I promise you, you'll quit. When we, a couple years ago, during COVID, there was not a lot of things to do in the um, region and the province opened up the parks. So we went to Ganaraska and we just rode horses and Sandaraska had the thing open. So we just camped, got the farthest campsite and said, we're going to have a great time. So we started riding. You know, those first couple miles when you haven't done it in a while, oh, short little rides are no problem. It was a little tight in every joint in my body. It was just like the muscles were being stretched. And you know, you could focus on, ow, 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 I hurt. And miss all that is around you. Or you can be focused on, what's my horse going to do? Is he going to be doing something stupid? If what she's thinking, you know, oops, she's twitching. You know, I know I'm going to be on my rear end somewhere and she's going to be halfway back to Oshawa. I, I do, you know, you think about all of the things that happen. There, there's animals in the bush. There's this, there's that. Am I reading the map right? Is my GPS right? Is my compass right? You can be focused on everything that could go wrong, but you miss the beauty of Ganaraska in the fall. One thing about it, if you ever see Ganaraska, it changes so quick. One minute you're in beautiful evergreens, dense. The next thing it, you're in changing leaves of maples and birch and everything like that. Then you're in open field. The scenery changes so rapidly, you're, you don't even believe you're in the same place. 
The next morning you get up out of bed and you're like, what was I thinking yesterday? I should have done three miles instead of 10. But you do it again. For five days, we rode almost 60 miles and never left Ganaraska. It was the, probably the greatest vacation and all we had in it was just the site fee. That was it. But it was something we will always remember. But you know, by the end of the week, we didn't want it to stop. Our bodies had got accustomed to the riding. Our bodies had relaxed to all the possibilities of what went wrong the first couple of days or what could go wrong. And we just enjoyed the ride. This is what Paul says. I don't let the circumstances determine the outcome. I don't let the circumstances determine my outlook. I have learned to be content. Whether in prison whether starving, whether full, whether I have support from the churches or who doesn't support me and who supports me. I don't worry about that because I have learned that God will meet my needs. He doesn't look back and says, I was a failure. I was a murderer. I was this. God's used me. And as we commit to Christ and biblical Christian faith, we too will not worry about what's around us or who's around us, who's falling, who's superior, who's not superior. We're going to be focused on God. Let me press toward the mark. Help me live my life in where you put me and be that blessing to those around you. May God help us as we preach this message of the longest ride this morning. Heavenly Father, use this message, I pray, for your honor and your glory and to challenge us and to encourage us and equip us for the days ahead. Thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you for never leaving us nor forsaking us. Thank you for always instructing us, guiding us, and helping us through this journey of life. Thank you for your Son and the Holy Spirit to help us in every step. In Jesus' precious name, amen. One sure way to get discouraged, to want to quit, is to start thinking about all that could go wrong. The farther you get away from camp, well, needless to say, you wonder. And when we went out, all of our horses are green broke. Let's put it that way. One had never been off the farm. And we were like, what is she going to do? She was good as gold, except for wanting to go swim. You know, we look at life and sometimes we use hypotheticals, I could say. Well, what if, and we don't do it? Well, what if we don't do it? What if it doesn't come? Is that going to deter us from stepping out? What if I fail? Great. My dad says failure is a stepping stone of learning. I'm sure glad Thomas Edison didn't give up. <laughs> I'm sure glad Alexander Graham Bell didn't give up. I'm sure glad the Wright brothers didn't say, well, not going to work. We only did 100 feet. I'm glad a lot of these people, Louis Pasteur, we wouldn't have penicillin today. You think about all these medical advancements we have, all of the technological things. What if Ford would have given up? What if McLaughlin would have given up? What if all these people would give up? We'd be, <laughs> we'd be sweating to death by the time we got to church. You know, we'd be soaked. We'd be still clicking horses. We'd still be feeding. We'd still be... How do we get groceries? Osha wouldn't be the size because it would have been hub centers. Look at us today. I was just talking to my father this last week. And we were talking about trying to imagine what he's seen in 91 years. Changes. Just, just can't, I mean, think about this. Went from prop planes to jet planes to cars that maximum speed 40 miles an hour and then you look at today he's got a car that keeps him in his lane <laughs> you know it's like he said I love this car I said why he said man I just slightly veer and, and it just brings me back in my lane he says are you shouldn't be driving he said well the car drives for me I said but what if it's not <laughs> you know you look at this it's like you laugh and you think could he have ever imagined a car would break when he got too close a car would veer him back in his lane when he wandered. You have 
clappers that turn on electricity. You know, you could say, hey, Google, find my phone. Hey, Siri, find my phone. And it'll tell you exactly to a couple feet where your phone's at. You think about that. You have all this technology. What have we seen? You think about all that God has equipped us with for life. We have an endless resource of knowledge through God's word. If anyone lack wisdom, let him ask in faith. Be prepared. The transform, transformation God does in our life through Christian growth is the likeness of Christ is not accomplished overnight. Rather, it's a lifelong process. The truth is, even the person whom you most admire as a Christian is still in need of spiritual growth and stretching of faith. There is no one perfect, just as we're not perfect until we're in heaven. If we begin looking at, well, that person can do better in trail riding because they got a better horse, better train, better saddle, better this. You know what? You know what I found out about saddles? They all have to be broken in. And once I have, and I have a saddle that's broken in for me, it fits me good. I love it. Whether I have another horse or not, I will always keep that saddle because it fits me. It's perfect. That's the great thing about it. It is everything you look at life. It's like it was tailored for me. My journey is different than your journey. Your journey is going to be different than mine. I may sit in your journey and go, boy, this is rough. You're like, huh, this is a piece of cake. Paul, in whatever state, I've learned to be content. I'm, I'm fine. Can you imagine how many churches looked at him and says, I couldn't go through that. I want to give you four keys to a successful trail ride. Spiritual one, that is. Be prepared. Be prepared to be there. You know what? Our saddlebags had a med kit. Just band-aids and stuff. Be prepared. It had food. It had our slickers. The weather guy said it was going to be sunny. Don't believe him. We were out in the middle of Ganaraska and all of a sudden it was like, where does this come from? Slickers on. And we got drenched. They didn't say anything about rain. But it's amazing. Then they called for rain and it was sunny. We left the camp and all of our slickers and everything like that. About halfway through we were like roasting. It's like, okay, off it goes. Never rained. You never know. Be prepared. Carry an umbrella, basically. You never know what is going to happen in life. As a Christian, preparation is essential for any journey, especially our spiritual journey. The Bible shows us how to prepare for this great journey. Many people are on a journey of life. They do not have the main ingredients to sustaining a good life, and that's salvation. What can we go through without hope? What can we go through without, Paul says, I press toward the mark. What was his mark? Success. Nope. His success was follow me as I follow Christ. He put his mark on the cross. He says, I want to serve God. He learned that when money wasn't there, he learned to be a tent maker. He learned to work with Aquila and Priscilla, learning how to sew leather clothes. He learned, he adapted. Christians, the older generation, we've learned to adapt. We haven't always been born, none of us, I don't think any of us born with a silver spoon. We just, hey, we started working at a young age. I started slinging papers at 12 years old to get my first Levi jeans. It's just how I've been. By the time I was 15, I was working at Merton GM detailing cars on the weekends. By the time I was 17, I was running the detail shop every day after school until closing at 8 o'clock. Things I've learned. I didn't have the life a lot of kids did. I was working all the time. He <laughs> said, like early morning, I'm delivering papers. Afternoon after school was done, I biked over to Merton GM on Airport Road and I began working in cars, washing cars in the winter and in the summer. Summer was great. You spray yourself. Winter was like, <clears throat> I think I feel my hands, you know. <laughs> 
But it was, it was wonderful because all of that prepared me for university. Come back from university, got a job back at Merton GM. This time as their assistant detail manager. Worked with Jamp Pharmaceutical making medicine. Many things has helped me where I am today. You look at all that God's done. He's given us the tools for life. But you know what? A lot of this would not have been accomplished if I didn't have faith in God. Because with the adversity, knowing that God's in control has helped in the outcome. Where would we be? Let's take all of our salvations away. Presuming everyone's saved online and in, in the sanctuary this morning. Think of some of your worst trials that you've faced now to this day. Could you have done it without God? I know some of mine I couldn't have. Think about our world. Maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe you've lost a job. Maybe you lost your house. Maybe you lost everything has just been upside down. How could we have done it without faith in God? It's hard to imagine without faith. It's hard to imagine going through the troubles of life without God. Salvation. That's what gives us that hope. That's what gives us that trust. That no matter what happens in life, we can be prepared for the journey for whatever may come. Not by works, Titus 3, 5 says, of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. It is the gift of God that has given this hope, that has given us this ability to handle the adversities, to handle the circumstances, to be prepared for this journey. Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Jesus said unto him in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Acts 4, 12, Jesus said unto them, I am, or excuse me, there, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Verse after verse after verse tells us where to put our faith and trust. Leaving camp every morning is a checklist. Do we have this? Do we have that? Do we have this? Why? Because we knew 10 miles in a car is nothing. 10 miles on a horseback in a winding forest with a guy who can't ride a map to save his life. Whoever, yeah, never, I'm going to go there. Whoever drew Ganaraska's map in the East Forest, he had to go back to map drawing. It was a lost cause trying to, I can read a map pretty good. I was a truck driver, but this, this map was, this guy was, he must have been high. Because none of them, I mean, it was bad. And cell phones don't work out there, I promise you. So when you look at life, we had to be prepared. We realized after the first day, the map was inaccurate at best. <laughs> Central Forest did a good job. East Forest, Horrible. You made it as you went. And you know, but when we realized that, we were prepared the next day not to put too much faith in the map and just go by what we could get from our GPS and other things, and we enjoyed the ride. But we were prepared. The next day we say, oh, we need to bring more water. We need to bring this. We need to bring that. We were prepared after the first beginning of the journey. As we grow in the Lord, guess what? It prepares us for more trials, more different things, more people we meet, how to deal with people, how to deal with circumstances, how to deal with circumstances in our life. That is the second thing. In order to be prepared, we have to trust the map. Not all maps are accurate, but praise the Lord, one map, the Word of God, is without error. I'm glad that in hardships, I can open God's word and I can see stories of Jacob, Ruth. I can see stories of Joseph, 
Job, Peter, Paul. I can see stories that touch my life and say, if they can do it with God's help, they serve the same God I do. Trust the map. Because when we get in hard times, the best thing we do is just open this book and say, God, in all thy ways, help me acknowledge you. Lean not unto my own understanding. I don't understand a lot of things. I don't understand trials. I don't understand why. Sometimes I would love to know the answer to everything that I've faced. But there are things in my life that we have faced some trials. I still don't know the answers why. But it's okay. Because one day when I'm ready, God will tell me the answers. And I'll be like, ah, oh, that's why we went through that. But you know what? He just wants us to be faithful. Because he is faithful. Turn with me to Psalms 119, 89. Psalms 119 and verse 89. The reason I can trust this map is because God himself says forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. The reason it is so true and so prevalent for today, yesterday, and tomorrow. Because it is settled. There is nothing that needs to be changed about it. It was good for my father in his 91 years. It's good for me and it'll be good for my children and grandchildren. It won't change. Guess what will change? The world. The world's going to change. Who knows? What's tomorrow's going to look like? It already is different. Just in the years that I've lived, the 50 years, half a century, things have changed a lot. I remember my favorite time the kids was sitting in the back of the station wagon looking backwards, making faces at everybody driving behind. Those station wagons were great. And there was no seat belts on those back station wagons. They folded down and it was these great old Cutlass Supremes. They were wonderful. And what was worse about them was my dad chose to buy the 6.2 diesel in them. So you smelled the diesel smoke the whole time. I was the man that got it started. Here, take a gas rag, put it over the distributor and let us fire it up. They were called the Gutless Cutlass for a reason. But you know, you look back, a lot has changed. I remember sitting on my dad's lap driving the van. We could do that back then. Things that I am glad we didn't have cameras for because it would have been all over the internet, all of my bad things. Amen. <laughs> they resolve, they reside in my brain and that's where they're going to stay. <laughs> I don't have to worry about anybody coming back and say, oh, we got you on film. No, you don't. <laughs> because my film was, remember the old 110 with the flashbulb? That was my camera. And your curiosity gets the best of you. You open it up and your whole film's ruined. Hey, what's it look like? Oh, you just ruined the film. Oh, well, <laughs> let's try again. But there's a lot of things in life that I wouldn't change. There are a lot of things I would. But you know what? They serve as a lesson for me not to do it again. But one thing that I would not change is my faith and trust in the map. God's word has been there. And that's why... Titus 1-2 says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. I'm glad Titus says God cannot lie. If God says to me as his child that I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, I believe him. If God says I will be there to comfort you, I believe him. If he says his word is without error, and without apology, as he says, I believe him. I don't have to doubt him. I don't have to say, well, is it true? Is it not? No. Because the moment I start not believing this is true, then what faith do I have? Then my faith, my hope, it's a lie. That is one thing I realized real quickly. 
about the Ganaraska map. It was not accurate. So you know what that began? Is this trail really here? Is that really accurate here? And it began to make you doubt the map. And that's not a good thing when you just see trees going, um, yeah. But you know what I did? When I did have cell phone signal, I downloaded an app for equestrians. And it pinpointed my waypoint of camp. And I trusted that GPS to get me back every day from then on when we realized the map could not be trusted. It led us in doubt. We kept it as a guide. <laughs> we kept it as a general. <laughs> We're somewhere here. But I'm glad I don't keep this around as a general guide. It is my guide. It is my hope. And as we be prepared and as we trust the map, thirdly, one of the greatest things about enjoying the life is expect the unexpected. Don't let troubles catch you by surprise and say, oh, we're all going to face troubles. Just, just get that off of the books right now. We're all going to have a rough ride somewhere. And this is where the Bible says, he is there for us. Even the disciples. I don't know if they figured that being with Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, they would never face any adversity. But how many storms did they have? How many times were they hungry? How many times were they thrown out of town? How many times were they accused of things? How many times? All throughout the Gospels, you'll read, the disciples were not popular. Jesus was not popular. And we know the world said to Jesus, crucify him. Let his blood be on our children. That's how much they hated him. Life as a Christian is full of turns and bends and unexpected journeys. But God knew that. That's why when he penned the word of God, he put heroes of the faith like Job. What a man. The Bible starts out by telling us about Job, that he was a austere, righteous, skewed evil man. He was a man of faith. He even prayed every morning with sacrifices for his children who were not walking with him. And while he's in his devotion time, think about this, he's in his devotion time with God, and a messenger comes and says, uh, Sir, your camel's all gone, and your servants are all dead. I only am here to tell you. And you know what the Bible says? He didn't even finish. And it says, uh, sir, your donkeys are all gone. Your servants are all dead. Uh, sir, your cattle. Sir, uh, I was a servant at your son's house, and we were having a celebration party. Everybody was there, your whole family. And a tornado came. They're all gone. Can you imagine as a human being and as a father and as someone who loves hearing one right after another bad news? We've all experienced that phone call. We've all experienced they're gone. But can you imagine your whole world, your whole wealth Everything, one right after another. And then the one you love, curse God and die. Just go ahead and get over with, honey. Man, I, I was going through all those verses today and going, how would I react if I lost my children? I lost everything I have, not that I have much, but I lost everything I had. And I'm sitting there moaning, and my wife goes, honey, God's not worth serving anymore. Just curse God and die. You'd feel betrayed. I guarantee you'd feel confused. You would probably be like me, just hit the bottom of depression and go, what's the point? But you know what Job said? He put sackcloth and asses and started praising the Lord and says, naked I came from my mother's womb 
Naked I return, blessed be the name of the Lord. Talk about adversity. Did he conf- was he confused? Yep. Did he lose his faith? It wavered. He wondered, he even said, God, why was I even born? For what purpose? God had a purpose. You know what that book is there for? Me. You know what that book's there for you? Think about Joseph. It wasn't his fault his dad liked him better than the rest. He didn't tell dad, I want to be your favorite. His dad showed favoritism. His brother hated him. His brother sold him. Lied to the father. Sent him off to be a slave. And you think about this. His dad had no idea. His, son, his brothers had no idea what happened to him. Out of sight, out of mind. Until, think about this. If he was 30 when he ascended, he would have been in his 40s when he met his brothers. That's a long time. He would have dressed like an Egyptian. He had been talking like Egyptian. And they would have never guessed their brother was prime minister. (laughs) And he says, you know what, guys? I forgive you. What you meant for bad, God meant for good. I'm here for such a time as this. Talk about adversity. All he did was stand up for truth. Put in prison because he refused to violate the vows of Potiphar and his wife. Fused to have an adultery. Accused of rape. Sent him to prison. Forgotten about after he tells the butler and the baker about their dreams for another two years. And yet, they did not ever imagine their life would turn out that way. We ought to expect the unexpected Let we know that troubles are going to happen. We know that trials are going to happen. Daniel was taken away as a young man to Babylon to serve as a slave. As the brightest mind of Israel taken for Babylon's use. And yet he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat. He purposed in his heart that he was going to put God first no matter what. And we see in his older age three times a day He bowed and prayed. There are so many illustrations in God's word that I'd be here all day to show what God is capable of when we trust him. These men knew their life would not be perfect. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew the adversity that if they stood and they did not bow, they were going to go to the fiery furnace. Did they expect Jesus walking in the fire with them? No. But they expected to be persecuted for their faith and were willing to do so. The disciples knew. Peter knew before he even surrendered fully to the ministry. Jesus says, when you're old, you'll be led to the cross. He knew. Did it stop him from being a great preacher of Jerusalem and around the world? No. He died in Rome, hanging on a cross upside down. You look at this. It didn't stop. Because they had the word of God that says the righteous shall suffer persecution. When we begin to expect that our horses are not going to be perfect, That there is going to be rain. There's going to be hot. There's going to be bugs. It's Ganaraska. There's going to be everything else. We were prepared to handle each situation as it come. That is what life is about. Learning to prepare ourselves to handle each situation as it comes. Not that we'll know what's going to happen at the end. But how do we handle it? The Bible says, cast all your cares upon him for he careth for you. Sometimes I can't bear the weight of what life gives me. I have to pass it on. Say, God, 
if I take it on myself, I'm going to crack. I, I'm going to crumble. I'm going to fail you. You got to take it. A lot of times my wife my has reminded, give it to God. Give it to God. Because I'm like any man. I'm like any woman. I bear the burden sometimes because I feel like I can handle it the best. We all are made that way. Every one of us. We're made to handle the situation, but there's some situation we just can't handle on our own. That's why Paul ends in Philippians says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthen me. Everything we do is because of him. Job never imagined he would get his family back. It wasn't the family he birthed and watched grow and get married. It was a new family. God gave him new wealth because God tested him because Satan says, I guarantee you, God, God already knew the outcome. <laughs> You're not fooling him. But he wanted to prove to Satan that Job did not serve him for finances. That he served him because he loved him. God may test us in our life to test our stickability. It's easy to give up when we're hurting. Amen? Been there. Getting back in the saddle on that second day, I felt every joint I did not know I had. When I sat down, it's like, oh man, those first couple miles were like, this is getting rough. At one point, I even took my overcoat that was strapped to the back of my saddle and put it underneath my saddle just to give it a little bit more cushion. But you know, after a while, you just have to suck it up and say, you're going to be okay, big boy. Keep on riding. And by the end of the day, it was like, you don't even notice it. Third day, piece of cake. Fourth day, your body got used to being stretched. Just like working out. You're not going to start walking six kilometers. You walk a couple. You get your body used to that exercise. And that's what God wants to do. Little by little. Inch by inch, what a cinch. By the yard, it's hard. Little by little. You're not, God's not going to test you like Job right off the bat. I promise you that. He tests little things. That's why he says, O oh, ye of little faith. Did he test, test the disciples with persecution right off the bat? No. Nope. He tested them with food, shelter, storms. Many little things. Just It was little things he tested the disciples to see how we do. Then he was getting persecuted. And it wasn't directed at them. Who is Jesus Christ of Nazareth? They didn't ask who the disciples were. They asked who Jesus Christ was. And they still got scared. Because they assumed. And all the while Jesus had been teaching them. They're coming after me. I am here to fulfill my father's meal, my f will. My meat is to do my father's will. He kept telling them over and over. I have to die for the sins of the world. I have to be that sacrifice. And they kept missing it. They kept missing it. They assumed it was them. You know what he told Peter? Your time has not yet come. It's not yet. It will. Expect the unexpected. When you learn to be prepared, when you learn to trust the directions in the map, and you learn to expect the unexpected, trials will come. You can then enjoy your ride. That's where Paul says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He says, I am not worried about those things are behind. I can't change anything in my past. I can't. We all, I guarantee you, we can all go back to the old VHSs and say, I wish I could rewind some of my life and make better choices. If I had a choice, I would have bought a thousand shares in a company called Google. You know, I remember when they were talking about that at work. Oh, yeah, anybody want to do some penny stocks in Google? What's that? I wish I had a few penny stocks, don't you? Or how about Apple? You know, or Walmart? 
You think about all these things. Man, we were at the beginning of all this. <laughs> and if we would only gone back and going, hmm, let's, I can do a thousand pennies, now can't you? We'd all be very, very rich right now. But we didn't. But a lot of us would rewind the things, the decisions we've made, people we hurt, choices we made. It has defined us, good and bad. But I'm glad that God forgives, God forgets. And we need, as Paul says, forgetting those things behind. They have defined us who we are. Didn't take God by surprise. But what have we learned? How can we be better? How can we do it right from now on? This is the great thing about life. God doesn't necessarily give a do-over, but he gives a new day. Thy mercies are new every morning. I'm glad Lamentation says that. Great is thy faithfulness. God gives us a new day. When God's in control, we should sit back and enjoy the ride and soak in the surroundings. God's sending us on a journey that's once in a lifetime. We're not going to be reincarnated as a frog, a tree, or anything else. We have got to enjoy this life. And really, what a life we have. We are blessed beyond all measures. Look to your left, look to your right. God's given you someone to be with. God's given you the life we have. Is it perfect? No, I wish it was. Are we have difficulties? Yep. Do we have financial difficulties? Sure do. Do we have physical difficulties? Yep. Do we have health issues? Yep. We have a lot of things, but we are blessed. My mom also always reminded me, we can be born in a third world country with nothing. But God allowed us to be born here. We're blessed. We can look around and we say, mom says, well, you could not have been born at all. That's, a, that's an issue. <laughs> but we're here. You know what? And each day is a blessing from the Lord. And as we look at life, too many times we can relax. Too many times we relax and not be observant of what's around us. Other times we can relax and know that God is in control. It's a double-edged sword. Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Has God ever let us down? Not me. I've let him down. 1 John 4, 4, ye are of God, little children, have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Psalms 46, 1, mom quoted to me, to our family often, because this is what they quoted over and over in the prisoner war camp. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. I don't know what that was like, never been there but my mom always said these words that she learned from her Canadian school teacher Mrs. Goforth you can become bitter or better through trials think about that statement none of us ever grew up in a prisoner war camp but sometimes we know people that have become bitter over circumstances than better we become resentful angry Instead of saying, how is this going to define me? For the better or for the worst? Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Think about that. All things work together for good. I don't know what's going to happen. Been there just four years ago. Now hear it again. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But I know that God orchestrated this. What has he got? Has he ever been mean to us? Nope. 
But notice what it says, to them that are called according to his purpose. I know. Just like I do 17 years ago, I'm here for such a time as this. Until God gives me another verse to change my mind, I'm not done. I'm only done when he tells me. You're only done when he tells you. Don't quit before then. My dad used to say, wouldn't it be awful if you're running the race or Paul says, I'm pressing toward the mark, I quit. And the Lord comes back the next day. <laughs> he goes, wouldn't it be awful if you quit the day before the rapture? <laughs> he goes, man, you'd be going to heaven going, oh, really? <laughs> you live with that for all of eternity. I quit the race just before it was called. I always love what one of my professors used to say. God never says how fast you ought to run the race. He just says, run the race. He says, I am a plotter. You know what? Some of us are walkers. Some of us are joggers. Some of us are plotters. You know what? Just finish the race. Every, don't look and say, well, that guy's a lot faster. He may be. But God's called you to run your race. If God's called you to be a plotter, you plot along. God calls you to be a walker, you walk along. There is no mistake why they have this story of the tortoise and the hare. Just be that tortoise. Just be consistent. That's what God wants. He's required us to be faithful. That's all. And as we think about this, run the race. Finish the trail ride. Get to the end. Don't focus too much on the ride of others. Don't look back at the mistakes you made along the way. Satan loves to get believers off the track by showing seeds, by sowing seeds of dis discontent, jealousy, and discord. He also likes to plant half truths and lies, such as you'll never amount to anything. Just look at your past. Or you'll never be as good a Christian as them. Why keep trying? In this letter to the Philippian church, Paul urged them to keep their eye on the prize. The crown of glory awaiting them in heaven. This oh so practical book, Paul writes to that church and says, keep on going. Paul encouraged the early church and us not to get distracted by worldly concerns, past mistakes, or the actions of others. Plant our feet daily in God's word. Learn the scriptures and replace the enemy's lies with God's truth. You will grow in maturity. You will begin to feel that peace that passes all understanding. With your Bible as your map, move one foot and toward another, toward that end called heaven. Forward in a Christian life is heavenward. It's upward. We ought to pray, Lord, give me strength to deepen my faith. Give me strength to endure the trail ahead. Give me strength to not quit when battles are all around. We need God. As that song says, I need thee every hour. Every hour I need thee. That sweet hour of prayer needs to be all the time. I don't know what we will face tomorrow. But as that other song says, I know who holds tomorrow. These are the great thing about some of these old hymns. They're theologically sound and they are a blessing. I don't know who holds tomorrow. Yeah, we do. God holds tomorrow. The Bible says he holds the hands of kings in his heart. In his hand, hearts of kings in his hands, excuse me. God knows what tomorrow is. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He knows what a thousand years from now is. He knows how many great, 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 grandkids you're going to have if God tarries. Think about, man, I, I can't even think about one yet. But the thing is, he knows what's going to happen. He knew my father would have seven children and three in heaven. He knew that my father would have over 30 grandchildren 
and I don't know how many greats now. Wow, can you imagine that? You think about what God knows and why aren't we trusting him? God orchestrated Joseph's life before he was even born for such a time as this. God orchestrated Esther's time for such a time as this. All throughout life, God placed the right people at the right time. God knew. Why do you think God allowed Emelech and Naomi to go to Moab? Because there was a young lady named Ruth that needed to be a part of Jesus' lineage. Without Ruth, <laughs> David wouldn't have been born. God had a point. Rahab, why would God all of God's plan? You see how God works? It's beyond our imagination. But he works wonderfully. The longest trail ride is the best ride as a child of God we could ever have. It's got the greatest ending, the greatest reward. Lord, give us strength to finish the ride. Even when we're hurt, even when we're saddle sore, stay in the saddle. It'll be worth the ride. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for your promises. Thank you for your word. And Lord, we just ask you that you give each and every one of us strength to finish the race that you'd have us finish. Lord, that you'd help us to trust you in every aspect of our life. Lord, when we waver, when we doubt, strengthen us, O Lord, to not to have little faith, but to have the little faith that moves mountains. And Lord, we thank you for all that you've done for us and all that you're going to do. For you know our future. You know every step of the way. May we not lose faith. May we trust you with that childlike faith. Dismiss with your blessing, O Lord. Give us a great afternoon and help us as we return tonight with the spirit of worship as we look at John's letter to a special person in the church. May we be encouraged by it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. May the Lord bless you. Looking forward to seeing each and every one of you tonight at 4.30 as we spend time in prayer and 5 o'clock in evening worship. Lord bless and have a great afternoon.